All right. Peace to the planet. <laughs> our, the excitement is already kicking in because our guest today is probably going to be the most interesting personalities we have so far. Gorgeous, energetic lady, lawyer profession, and of course, an admitted legal practitioner of the High Court. Utara Yao, thank you so much for making the time to talk to us today. Thank you for having me. What an introduction. I hope I live <laughs> up to the, that intro. I truly, truly do, but well, thank you. You actually are. You actually are. <laughs> you were born and raised uh, by your parents who were highly involved in fighting against apartheid. And, you know, um, at, at, at the time, your parents were very, like, at the time, there were very strict rules and everything was so hard growing up. So, several occasions, not even, may ever made you feel like you deserve to be of your skin color, mm. which was hard. But just to start things off, thank you so much for joining us once again. Um, maybe as an icebreaker, okay, we know that where we are right now, Katakombe Restaurant, this is your fav- one of your favorite places to be. What's your favorite meal to come and have here all the time? I would definitely say the bamboo chicken. Bamboo chicken? Yes, hey. definitely hands down. Ah, okay. okay. So you have it all the time or you'd like yeah, to stick it up with something I mean, else? This this wasn't the first time that I had bamboo chicken, you know. Um, growing up, my parents raised us to be very tolerant. Okay. Um, so my father, um, he's his best friend's sister, she had a restaurant in Dongahook. Oh, okay. So my father would often take us there where we would have traditional Shibambu food. Mm-hmm. Um, you know, he loves mopane worms, he eats ikaka, he has the traditional beer, everything. Ah. So, you know, for me, this wasn't the first time, so to say. So, okay. yes, um, we've, we've, we've definitely been integrated into uh, the fabrics of Namibia, so to say. Um, yes. Okay, that's nice. So, <laughs> that's a whole nice traditional story. So yes, Katakombe has great food. It has great traditional food. Okay, so let's let's get to know you, man. Who would you say Utara is? Who's the lady behind that name? Uh-huh. Okay. Okay, I'll start with my name <laughs> since, since, since uh, we, you have brought it up. Okay. Um, okay, long story short, mm-hmm. um, I come from a mixed background. And what I've been mean mixed is just in terms of race. So my father is white and he's from Germany and my mom is colored from Cape Town, South Africa. So my parents met in Cape Town, but owing to apartheid, you know, they couldn't get married there. So my parents then migrated to Germany um, where they then could get married. And I have two brothers who were born in Germany. Mm -hmm. So as a reflection of, you know, the combination that is my parents, we have a European name and then we have an African name. Mm. So mine, my African name is Utara, Utara. which is now an Oshirero name, mm-hmm. um, which I'm told is she's a winner, but some of my clients have told me that it means the truth always the truth. wins. So all our names are in connection with the political timeline. Okay. So my brother, my firstborn brother was born in 85. So his name is Tulani, which Tulani. is Zulu for okay. the quiet one. The quiet. Because it was at a time when, you know, we weren't really sure if we would beat apartheid. And then my other brother was born in 87. Mm-hmm. And his name is Temba. Tem- and Temba in Isikrosa means hope. So in 87 there was hope. And then I was born after independence. And we won. So that's where the name Mm. came from. So I think it's very safe at this point to say that my parents are extremely politically active because all our names correspond with the political timeline. And yes, after three years of having lived in Germany, my mother said, no, she's tired. And um, that's then how my parents came back to Namibia. So Mm -hmm. I'm a born Namibian. I was born here. I've lived here my entire life um, and yes I schooled here and then commenced further studies in, in South Africa. Okay well what, what school did you go to here in Namibia? I went to Vintage International School International. and then I did my International Baccalaureate Okay. and then from there I went to the University of Cape Town mm-hmm. um, where I initially just did a Bachelor of Social Science degree and I majored in Economic History um, as well as international relations and then um, 
I, at that point, I really wanted to work for like a think tank agency. Oh, and yes. I thought but l- just quickly, let's take, let's take you back to okay, growing up, uh, to just you know, that period of going to school, um, primary school and all that. What, what was it like growing up as a young kid? What was going on at home? How was it like, you know, your siblings and everything? Mm. How, was it, how was growing up like at home? So, um, growing up was very interesting. First so, you grew up with all your siblings here, right? All of them here. Okay, so, okay. It, it's really, it's just... The, the nuclear family because okay. my mom's entire family is in South Africa okay. and my dad's entire family is in Germany so right. really it was just my parents my two older brothers and myself okay um I grew up with two very overprotective older brothers oh wow <laughs> so it wasn't always <laughs> easy no boy would ever uh, yeah no and at the same time they bullied me because they believed I was too soft so so you know, at that point, WWE was, was still a thing. thing. It yes, wasn't yes, WWF yes, yes, yes. yet. <laughs> okay. So, yeah, we would often wrestle on my mother's bed and get into trouble for that. So, yeah, safe <laughs> to say I was a tomboy for, for quite for some quite time. Quite some time. Because you were yeah, the only girl. I, yeah, I was the right? only girl and I had no yes. other option. You know okay. what I'm saying? Like, it was the two of them and then there was me. And, okay. You know, so. Um, but growing up, yeah, it was very, very interesting um, just because also the type of discussions we had around dinner tables, you know, it was very much about understanding the privilege that we have. You know, my mom would always tell us, I can't give you anything. I can't, you guys, when I die, there's no house for you to inherit. Ooh. There are no cars, there's no company, there's nothing. But All what I can age were you being told this? Ooh, very young. Probably, I think my earliest recollection is like 10. And you think that was right for them to do, right? Yeah, 100%. Yeah. Because, I mean, all three of my parents' kids are successful. We've all forged a career path for ourselves. Okay. Um, I think it's safe to say that we, we are well-rounded individuals who understand our privilege and who understand the opportunities that we've been given. And I think we've all made the best of the opportunities that we've been given you know so from a very early age it was made very known to us that look the only thing us as your parents we can give you is your education and what you do with that is up to you but there's nothing else there's nothing else they, 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 you know don't expect that once we are gone that somehow there's some sort of system that will carry you you know you need to you need to work for yourself and you, Growing up, wasn't easy. Yes, and yeah. you know, I, I, my brothers are a bit more darker in complexion than what I am. Okay. So, people, I obviously, I am white appearing, and I'm received as white. Um, my brothers, not so much. So for me, it was very difficult growing up because I had quite a identity crisis because I'm mixed. I grew up in this mixed home. But now I come to school and I'm constantly being asked, okay, but what are you? Yeah. And I'm like, oh. <laughs> <laughs> I, 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 I don't quite know what to tell you, yeah, yeah, you know, and uh, at some point. The reactions, what are the reactions that you tell um, Some were like, oh yeah, no, we can tell. Others were just like, um, you know, it, 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 like the idea of me being mixed and me coming out so light was just like, you know, people couldn't really wrap their heads around it and um, I remember my, my my brothers you know they introduced me to hip-hop and you know Talib Kweli was one of the, the artists yes and he's got the song called Black Girl Pain you know and the chorus is you know they just know the name they don't know the pain black girl now I am by no means saying that I know what it means to be a black female in this world that is an intersectionality which I will never ever understand why because I'm received as white so I attract white privilege but for me it resonated with me because I was like there's a part of me that people don't understand because you know when you hear people speaking about black people in derogatory terms you, you, you receive it as someone talking about you because of the person that your mother is but they don't see it as that because externally you're not you don't appear as that so um, you know my brothers were very influential in me just being like this is who I am it is what it is my parents equally I remember my dad used to buy me books for the coconut my mom used to yes you know my so growing up I had a very supportive 
family structure, you know, that really grounded me um, in a way that it was like, you have privilege, um, but also understand that this other side is part of you. How significant would you say is for parents and support you as I think it's extremely significant because the way I see it is, is that, you know, there's this world out there that parents can't control, right? Parents don't control the interactions that the kids have. Parents don't... When they're in the outside house. Yes, when they're outside the house. You know, as a parent, you can't control the things. If your child gets bullied at school, it's very difficult to control that, you know? Growing older, if, you know, if your child faces problems at university or whatever institution they go to, it's very difficult. The same applies to work environments. It's very difficult. So I think with us, what was so nice is we had the exposure to the external world, but we knew that there was sort of a safe space to come back to, where we could reflect, where we could share with our parents what it is that was happening. So I think from my side, I think that support from a family setting, it need not necessarily be parents, um, but I definitely think it's important to have that environment where kids can go out experience the real world for what it is, but not lose themselves in it and not able to retreat, come back to a safe space where they can, you know, reflect, introspect. Um, and I think just generally, it's very important to know who you are, very important to know where you're going so that you're not swayed in every direction. There are various influences out there, both good and bad. Um, and it's just very essential that you know yourself, you know who you are, and you know sort of the general trajectory that you are. Life will always throw you curveballs, and it will always take you in a different direction, and you need to learn how to adjust equally. Um, but generally, I think the home support is extremely important. So, how would you say you found, kind of um, found yourself in the growing up, trying to find yourself and trying to understand where you're heading as a young person? You know, obviously, take putting into your God all the times that, that life that life brought. Um, well, like I've alluded to already, first of all, the home setting um, was really, really important. But also, I think engaging with people from different backgrounds um, from who had different life experiences you know because you in that moment you may think your experiences are so tough and you know they it's so difficult to work with until you meet someone and you realize okay yo let me just check myself um, let me not make it bigger than what it is and I think what's most important is coming to terms with what it is that you're surrounded by and really finding a solution to it in a, in a meaningful way, whether that's through dialogue, um, you know, whether it's through poetry, whether it's through music. A lot of people find solace in, in, in you know, in music. But for me, what really helped me was the interactions that I had with people, you know. Um, my late aunt was very pivotal in my life, you know. She would teach me about black consciousness movements and you know so in, in those ways you, you come to realize I mean I remember I was um, I think I was about 10 years old and we had to do a project and everyone you know was doing projects on like Albert Einstein and you know these like inventors and whatever and I was like no I want to do my project on Nelson Mandela because that you know that was the context in which I, I grew up in. So really it was through dialogue with various people um, that I was able to sort of establish, okay, this is what I want for myself, this is what I don't want for, for myself, and just to be comfortable. Okay, yeah, you, you perceive this white, you know, even though you come from a mixed background, and that's okay. It, it doesn't necessarily, your opinions of others doesn't necessarily define what you, through your background, through your understanding of self, have decided what it is. And obviously culture and your traditions, I'm not saying, you know, we're this individualistic, we just decide who we are. But I think it's it's very important to sometimes take a step back and to decide what what will define you and what will not define you. Let's go to Teju. Uh, yes. What? Yes. You went uh, to UCT. UCT, yes. Uh, so initially I did a Bachelor of Social Science in um, Economic History and International Relations and um, then 
like I said at the time, I thought, okay, I'm going to do some think tank work. Um, let me combine that with my with a law degree. I thought the two would be a good combination. So then I pursued my law studies at UCT as well. Um, and then once I was done, after having had sort of numerous conversations with lecturers, a lot of them had said, you know what, first get your admission. Do your hours, do your articles, and then get your admission. And once that's out of your way, um, it will be easy for you, or easier for you, to then move into the direction that you want to move into. Because then you have actually grappled with the law, you actually have grappled with litigation. Um, so that's what, then what I decided to do. So I came back to Namibia. And I, 2017 I came back to Namibia and then I worked for a law firm here in Namibia. Got my admission and then practiced as a um, admitted legal practitioner. And now I've moved into the corporate sphere. And then uh, when you do your law degree or thesis, yes. was um, uh, investigative commercialism, commercialization is uh, of education is viable in South Africa? Yes. So um, I, I did mine in jurisprudence and the constitution. Now, jurisprudence is just basically a fancy term for philosophy of law. And um, Essentially what I did there was I took a medical theory and I applied it in the context of the information. And basically the medical theory, what it asks is if you have a pill, right, that can take someone from being very severely disabled to severely disabled, and that same pill can take someone from slightly disabled to perfect health. Who do you give them? So what moral obligation do you have? Um, because the idea behind this is that you want to reach a perfect state of equality. And how do you then reach a perfect state of equality? And, um, so I took that theory then and I applied it in the context of education. So my thesis question was, yes, like you said, is nationalization of education a viable option in South Africa? And um, the problem with most theories, this is not just from the jurisprudence point of view, is that um, you, so for example, if you were to say you have a blind person and a blind person, or able sighted person, how do you reach equality between them? Well, logic would dictate that everyone must be blind in order for us to then reach this level of equality. But then you open yourself up to what they call leveling down objection. We're saying that, okay, to reach the state of equality, we must bring everyone down. Now, in the case of South Africa, um, at the time, I must admit I'm now not as familiar with statistics, but at the time, just doing my thesis. South Africa's second largest expenditure was on education. And if you looked at the statistics, um, the public schools were not performing. And what actually, in the research that I did, what then governed sort of quality of education was your teacher student ratio. And um, the conclusion, if I may, um, I came to was just that unfortunately, that rather what should perhaps move for what I call standardization of education, which is where we say, you know how lawyers or accountants, um, doctors have to take sort of like a more example practice that teachers can say, just to try and sort of ensure the same quality of teachers across the board. Of course. That doesn't mean that there's equality, and neither does that mean that you know the the systems and the networks that you can tap into at private school level has now been made available at public school. Level. You know, if you're going to private schools, you're locking heads with certain people, certain networks, certain opportunities are available to you. Um, but yes, I just I I have a passion for that. In the Namibian, how do you do it? 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 How do you
Um, I, I haven't, so it would be very difficult for me to say in the absence of having done proper research and to, yeah, I wouldn't want to jump to conclusions too, too prematurely, but um, I will look into it. Do you still want to work on it? Yeah. Tell us more about it. Um, are we expecting more no big news from you because, I mean, why to be part of it? Um, I hope so. I hope there are big moves to be expected. Um, no, I, I, I think yes. I think right now, you know, I, it's very important because Think Tank essentially for me is policy advice. And, you know, in order for us to develop good policies, I think it's, it's super important that you don't just move into a system where you have a purely top-down approach where things are stated and you don't understand the conditions at the bottom. We've often seen this with projects that fail. For example, the uh, UN projects, UN housing projects in Kenya that have failed. So, for example, you build houses, people are connected to the water grid, the electricity grid, um, but then they can't pay for the to sustain this, this water connection, this electricity connection. Right? So, you need to understand that without proper employment, substantive employment, okay, people have housing, but they also need income to sustain themselves in these houses. So it's very important to have a holistic approach coming into this. Not that I'm a professional, not that I'm an expert, not that I, you know, I've delved into it. It's just based on my limited knowledge and my limited experience, you know, I think it's very important. So right now, what I'm trying to do for myself is, you know, gain as much experience as possible in various industries, various sectors, um, which I'm hoping then will put me in a position where I can work alongside a, a good team in my think tank. Um, in order for, because I think at the end of the day, it's collective effort. It doesn't boil down to individuals. It's what we can achieve as a Spoke of um, you can't job as a compliance officer yes. at the asset management company. Yes. Okay, so just tell us what your portfolio entails. Um, what is a compliance officer? Okay, so the long and the short, just to overly simplify it, is, is that what I need to make sure is, is that the company that I work for complies with all the regulations, the local laws, um, specifically like the licensing to make sure that we maintain our license and we hold our license with NAMFISA. So, unfortunately, I can't doubt you of that confidential information, oh, yes, but yes, that's well, the long and the short. Um, just wanna, I'm so interested to know more about the time as a youth because you see these platforms that want to kind of tell more stories of yes. the time of the and yes. how it was like growing up. What do you say are the things that you do in the younger days? Say from Boston, when you go sure. in your, your first day at your first job, you know, what was it like and what did you learn? Um, your, okay, that's... <laughs> That's a that's a that's a good question. Um, I think. Okay, I'll start with I'll start with varsity. I think what was very important um, at uh, for me at varsity was okay. So when I was still in varsity, it when the fees must fall movement oh. had just started. Yeah, so I was there for the first year, the fees must fall movement, and I would say that generally um, at that point is really when I realized, first of all, education is a privilege in South Africa. It's not a right in a meaningful way because unfortunately your right to a education or rather to even enter into an institution like UCT is based on your finances. So it's inherently financially exclusionary. And if you look at if you look at that contextually who have always been financially excluded. I mean, apart they created the system to exclude. Yeah, so, um, you know, it was, I mean, this has always been made known to us, um, just because of who my parents are, but with the fees must fall movement, it really came to the fore. Um, so that's really, for me, that was a big um, learning curve, or rather, it wasn't learning curve, it was, it, it, it it was a lesson that I had learned in the sense that 
you know what, we need to take far more proactive steps in things such as basic human rights because you cannot justify a limitation to that extent should solely based on finances. You, you cannot justify that. Not in a context like South Africa, neither in a context like Namibia. Um, and I think that um, one needs progressive youth organizations. Because remember, Fees Must Fall was, was, it wasn't, you know, some external organization. It was the students that started it. And it started in Johannesburg. And it was those students that then led. Um, that and not only in relation to fees must fall, but it was also in relation to outsourcing of, of workers, um, which essentially deprives them of their rights as well. Um, and that is what fees must fall managed to achieve: um, is to have all those outsourced workers insourced as well. That was part of the fees must fall movement. Um, so I think it's really important also that people realize that they do have voices and really if you can unite and you can band together, um, that you can actually make a change. Because I mean the universities came to a complete standstill. Nothing could take place. Nothing could happen. Nothing. Nothing. No exams were being written. Nothing. No lectures. Nothing. It came to a standstill. And this, was, this also affected the students' part. Yeah, it affected. I mean, some were obviously complaining. They wanted more, more university operations to continue. And then, but, you know, a large group was like, no, we cannot justify. I mean, students were then not allowed to write exams, for example, because they had outstanding fees. So, yeah, at varsity level, I think um, that was really um, eye-opening for me. And then, you know, shoot, growing up, um, I think um, what was, just remind me of your question again, sorry. What you learned during the time of the youth. Okay. Adversity and following time of the, okay, also time. to your time of, uh, you know, when you started working. Okay, when I started working, um, I think um, what, in terms of, um, so you see, because now I've been out of Namibia for seven years. So I, I, I did my undergrad, I did my law degree, and then I came back to Namibia after having lived away for, for seven years. So it was, um, the adjustment back here was, was, was very eye-opening, you know. Um, I, in South Africa, you know, um, I was exposed to different people, different places, um, you know, also I think Cape Town is a pretty cosmopolitan city, so you know there's a lot of flow, a lot of influx, a lot of different people. Um, so coming back to Namibia was 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 quite the adjustment for me. Um, but I think what I what I learned, especially in Namibia, is, is that um, there's a there's a very specific way in which you handle things, in which you, you, know, you deal with things. And I, I, what I appreciate about Namibia is just the level of humanity we still have left in our day-to-day -day interactions, you know. I remember the first time I went to court, I was expecting, you know, very official conduct because now I had never been to court, I had never, you know, and like, I remember when we went to the registrar of the high court, you know, everyone was like, hello Tate, how are you Tate, you know, and I was like, oh, you know, I was expecting sir, and you know, you know what I appreciate is like just the, the human element that has remained, and, which is very nice, which is really, really nice, and you know, just that really if you treat people in a certain way, and you know, you, you don't come in there with this pompous, arrogant, Demeanor that really, um, you know, but aren't, aren't low students still taught to be opposite, <laughs> actually? Yes, and it's terrible, and it's terrible. <laughs> I mean, I think lawyers have a very bad reputation oh, sure. of, of being a, a quite a arrogant, mm -hmm. and um, yeah, so yeah, it humbles you, and it's very important because at the end of the day, we're dealing with people, and um, I think that was that was that was most enjoyable for me, um, having commenced and just. You know, realizing at the end of the day that you you need to adjust yourself 
and you need to realize that at the end of the day, you're speaking to a human being. You know, you need to hold this person respect. It doesn't matter what university you come from, what degree you have. You know, yeah. Okay, color is still. Unfortunately, we live in a world where, um, yeah, where we, we, you know, and I think that. Um, it's. I just think it's 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 really important for us to create dialogue um, around certain intersectionalities. Mm. I think that's that's the only thing that I felt was still missing. You know, we need to create dialogue about around patriarchy in, in Namibia, which I think is still very prevalent. We need to create um, dialogue around the intersectionality between between race and gender, because. It's different to be a black male versus a black female, for example. So there's an intersectionality that exists there. So we need to create further dialogue around that. I think the youth need to become um, involved also in dialogues around employment creation. I think we can safely say with full word, um, our economy is not in the best shape. And I think that we need to, we need to engage our youth in um, what they believe is the way forward. I think waves need to start changing. And I think that um, it's, it's, it's really important that we take what our elders have taught us and we combine that with now forging a path ahead. So would you say it's safe for young people to be part of the then to what extent or what do they need to fall back to? I mean, we had the uh, first lady say that you know, it's good for young people to join politics and be part of it and be part of you know, the talks and bring about change. But do you think they should, what should, what do you think they should consider before just getting into it? Um, you know, I think this is just my personal opinion. I think that. Um, it's very important for us to understand both the economic and political framework that we, we are in. And I think that politics sh should not be confused with this thing where you, know, you come into this frame and you just talk about whatever it is that you believe in. I think in the world we operate within a system and we operate within certain ideologies, right? Yes. So, for example, um, I'm of the opinion that in order for us to have proper political participation, we equally need economic participation, right? So that means that our youth necessarily become uh, active members of our economic society and our economic structures. and. In order for us to really go into that, we need to have discussions on you know, what type of economic systems they are, um, what works, what hasn't worked. You know, I think, like I say, I think it's part of the dialogue in, and perhaps you know, sort of an activism school or something of that nature is, would be, I, in my opinion, good to integrate you know, sort of the, the current structures the current thought processes with the, you know, the fresh new youth that may also have their ideas. But I think it's very important to understand the, both the economic and the political system. And more importantly, to ask ourselves what type of participation we, we want in our society. You know, are we, are we, are we going to go back? to a grassroots level approach, like how, what, what do we envisage for ourselves, not only in our individual capacities, but, you know, as a, either as a community or as a group, being the youth, or whether it's a collective effort. No, but there are obviously factors that make it kind of impossible mm -hmm. for you to you know, be part of it, but then still there are some factors that can limit those things or to progress in yeah. making decisions as a youth or having a few ideas taken. Alright, but you seem to be a very busy lady. You have a lot on your plate to uh, really work with. Um, every responsibility when you being a uh, compliant officer must not happen. What do you do? What do you say you do in your spare time? 
sure. Um, in my spare time, gosh, um, I I do boxing, so yeah, I quite I quite enjoy that. In the, um, I wouldn't say fitness. <laughs> I think I think boxing is more like it. I'm not like a runner or or anything. Yeah, no, I I I I, I, I enjoy. I have a good coach. Okay. Um, so I I I do enjoy that. I think that's a very good. Um, stress reliever um, for me, and you know, obviously, um, reading a good book again. They, I, I, my mom is um, quite the intellect, so I grew up in a household where there are bookshelves. Um, so you, yes, so um, I try and read a book. You know, if my if my brain allows me to to no no no. I I like sort of autobiographies. You know, so at the moment I'm reading on uh, Thomas. Sankara. So, um, yeah, unfortunately, I think. These are African autobiographies. Yes, 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 you know. Um, Also, just, you know, I I come from a family where, um, like I said, there's a lot of tolerance and we have different theories that are floating around. And, you know, so I think nationalization and sort of prioritizing the community over the individual has been my common theme yeah. growing up. Um, so yes, I, li- I like to feed my mind with things like that. And then obviously seeing my, my family and doing activities. With There's an interesting story um, about, you know, now that you spoke about your sister, there's an interesting story about your brother's <laughs> <laughs> I'm sure you know what you're talking about. So last time, when the goal was were caught, yes. you know, by surprise, you know, mutilating. Yes. Tell us about this. No. So, um, my brother, his name is uh, Timba. Okay. He um, he graduated obviously in South Africa, so Timba is a, a common name there, you know. Yes. So um, uh, it was his graduation, and he got pulled out, and you know, so when. All the gogos in the room heard Timba, you know, they were ululating, so they're like, until my brother made his appearance, and then you just hear, you know, it went from, like you could hear the shock in people's voices. They were like, like, who is this Zungu? You know what I'm saying? They were like, ah, yeah, 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 no, 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 this cannot be. Greek, oh, wow. but yeah, no, it is. It, it's always been very interesting. Yeah, so um, <laughs> well, that's an interesting was, one. Yeah. It's a very, very interesting. That was that I'm was. I'm going to today. There's still there's always a story to laugh about. about yeah, no, it, it 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 is a story to laugh about. But equally, you know, I think I can safely say we, we all three of us, we carry our names with, with, with pride, and I think it's significant of, of the background we come from. Um, What's next? Whew, what's next? Those are those are big questions. <laughs> big questions. We want, want to know how you know this young person watching the show has seen. I mean, funny enough, a lot of people are actually inspired. You know, and just for their sake to understand, to be really for you know, you know, what do you say to the person in what you're about to do? Those are those are big questions. I, I, I wish I had a it's up for something, but um okay, okay. Um shoot. I think um I think most important is is that um often you will hear no and often you'll feel like doors are closing and often you'll feel like you know what Am I really cut out for this? You know, there's a level of self-doubt that will always creep in here and there. Um, especially when you don't hear yes the first time around. You know, you, you, you sort of just want to cave in and you're not sure whether this was the right path for you. So I think um, perseverance is extremely key. Self-belief is extremely key. I've already said knowing who you are. Take the time out. Take the time out to really introspect, um, learn who you are, figure out who you are, figure out, figure out what it is um, that you want. Um, and I know this sounds very cliche, but really um, work smart. 
Because there's a what I have learned is that there's a difference between working hard and working smart. Um, and really, I think we we it's also equally important to not be afraid of expressing who you are and what it is that you want. I think often we come into workspaces um, and you're just told that you must be, you know, you know, your boss sort of sees everything and that's it. And I know that, especially in the legal fraternity, you, know, um, you work late hours for almost next to nothing. And, you know, just remembering that there is this leverage that you have at the end of the day. And if you look at history and just understanding that you are, you, you are part of a community and if you can work with the, the community that you, that you form part of and also, I think very importantly is never to forget where you came from. Um, I think so often in life, we then, once we've made it, we make it about ourselves. And we forget that, you know, don't, you know, we forget to give back to the community that we came from in a meaningful way. I'm not just talking about a financial, from a financial perspective. I mean, really going back, sitting with, if you have a younger sibling or whatever it is, and really saying, you know, I know it can get tough sometimes, um, but I'm here and let's work through whatever challenges, challenges it is that you are, that you're what confronted you with. Where did I get my what from? Like, you know, you know, giving the you know, I think it's because I saw how it happened in my family that it sort of, it was just something that became inherent. So, for example, like something my grandfather taught us from a very young age was, um, you know, what he would do is if he availed an opportunity for something, let's say, hypothetically, we would own someone money because they needed it to do A, B, C, and D. And instead of demanding the money back, he said, you know what? Next time, when there's someone asking you for this, remember, remember what I did. The way you repay me is by assisting the person who has to pay. So it kind of just, you know, got passed down generations like that. So there's always a thing where it's like, if you're in a position to do something, and you can avail the person next to you with whatever it is that they're asking you, do it. Don't, don't just think of yourself. Remember, you're, you're part of something, you're part of a community. Do what you can, do your part, do your part. Because I know there's a tendency that last one, when Kiero is there, there was always the spoiled ones, right? There's always that one. <laughs> there's always that one. The money. Yeah. <laughs> no, 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 no. Uh, no that, that, wasn't, that wasn't the case with me. I think that there was no time for that. There was no time for that. No. They never give you a chance. Ah, no, no. Never, shame. never. Shame, eh? Yeah. yeah. <laughs> but anyway, so, yeah, it, it, it's, I think it's, it's, it's really important um, to sort of stick to your gun and, you know, try and remember where you came from and to impart a legacy. And I think that's what we always talk. It's really important, the legacy that you, that you leave behind. And just small things that instill perseverance. Like, if I can draw on my childhood, I remember if we started up, if we started polishing our school shoes at night, and halfway through, we left to go do something else, and the school shoes were left with the polish and the brush and everything, the newspaper covering the tiles was just left there. <laughs> oh! My mother would come back and she's like, if you start something, you don't, you don't stop halfway in between, you know what I'm saying? So, just basic things like that, I think one can incorporate in your, not that I'm an expert, I mean, different folk, different stroke, but yeah, those are my, different folk, different stroke, skiers, <laughs> but those are just things that I can uh, draw on from my, my personal experiences, so I'm not trying to give a generic, uh, yeah, you know, if people are kind of really, really too observant, they will come for you. Like, yeah, you said that, so yeah, we yeah, no, see uh, that. you said you was going to work. But don't yeah, it's my personal opinion, and I, I obviously I come from a position of privilege, so I don't want to say that I'm not privileged, but I think that there's a lot of privilege that comes with being in this country. Yeah, yeah, yeah. So I don't want to take away from that. Yeah, yeah, yeah. 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 Yeah, y
um, or to navigate the struggles of, of someone else, you know, because I don't know what they're going through. Um, and I can't even know what they're going through. So it's, yeah, it's just from my position, my privilege and the background that I have. But it's not to say that those who don't make it or you know, haven't found that movie at all, some are failures or, you know, haven't applied themselves properly. I think really what we what we really need to do is create this dialogue and create a system where we can absorb members of society that are constantly, the system's constantly telling them they're not worthy, they're not worthy. Because it happens every day, every day it's happening. That's, yeah, that's the really unfortunate truth. So, yeah, that's just from my side. I'm, again, I'm not as ready to know what other people are going Thank you, thank you. Thank you so much for coming. There you have it, people. You've heard that you need to know yourself. There's a lot that you really need to discover about yourself. We need you to do great things, just like a Tarot Yeah, man, it's been great. We had the Katakombe restaurant where you can get this extra additional food that you saw. We told you, you just heard from me that you know, the chicken here is delicious. So, yeah, man, for me, Johnny Conde, the top notch food is so for me here. Um, thank you so much for watching this episode. Don't forget to like, subscribe, comment, and share this with other young people so you can have us all in this fight. Thank you so much for this episode. Peace. Okay.